Good evening again, everyone. We are very honored to have in our midst this evening a distinguished group from the Bahamas. Um, and I was telling the Prime Minister that I never ceased to be amazed by some of the persons I've met here um, who had been living here for 30, 40 years with still an emotional attachment uh, to the Bahamas. And um, the Consul General has been working very diligently with that community. And um, it's just good to see you here this afternoon. Let me just introduce a few persons who, who are here, um, beginning with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Fred Mitchell, the Minister of Social Services, the Honorable Melanie Griffin, the Minister of Education, the Honorable Jerome Fitzgerald, the Minister of Housing and the Environment, the Honorable Ken, Kendrick Dorset, and the State Minister for Investments, the Honorable Kalis Rule. The purpose of this meeting is for the Prime Minister of the Bahamas to address you about matters Bahamian and uh, give you a few minutes to ask him whatever questions you may, may wish, uh, pose any ideas that you may have with regard to the Bahamas and where it is and its development. And I'm going to ask the Honorable Frederick Mitchell if he would be good enough to propose a uh, formal, in formal introduction of the Prime Minister. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, my parliamentary colleagues, uh, members of the cabinet who are here, uh, the leadership of the Bahamian community here, uh, the, the diplomatic uh, leaders. Uh, we've had, uh, of course, you, the ambassador from, uh, from the United Nations is here, Council General is here, ambassador to Washington is here, and Mrs. Newry, and the high commissioner to Canada is here. So the diplomatic community is represented, Mr. Kelsey Johnson uh, is here. So tonight, it's our special privilege and pleasure to welcome the Prime Minister to speak to us and to have a dialogue with us about uh, the Bahamas, where we're at, and uh, the future of our country. And I'm sure you're very interested in the developments that are happening there. Uh, he's no stranger to you, I'm sure. Uh, Forty years in the public life of the country, including the Senate. Forty years of public life. Uh, leadership in the Valley Boys, reputed to be the best dancer in <laughs> uh, He may put on a display tonight, um, but has provided exemplary leadership for our country. And through the highs, the lows, the troughs, the ups and downs, uh, has remained a steady force for leadership in our country. And we are privileged to have him tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Firstly, let me indicate that it is truly a pleasure to be here, to meet those of you who have come from the same land that I have come from. One or two of you I know by looking at you. Others, I'm sure, if you were to tell me who you are, I would have some connection with you and or your family. But I think it's a wonderful time for me to have an opportunity as Prime Minister to speak to Bahamians here in New York and to do so in the presence of a group of young persons who are studying here in the maritime industry, I see in their uniforms. And, and I'd like to acknowledge their presence. And really to do so in the presence of a group of young ministers of the government, some not so young, but but really, truly, who has the future in hand and will provide the continuity in governance, hopefully borrowing from those of us who have preceded them all of the good things that should be imported into the governance of the country. 
the Bahamas is still a young country, independence in 1974, and 1973, I beg your pardon. I actually began politics in 1974, being appointed to the Senate. And I should say to Fred, I'm now in my 41st year, um, 74 to 2015. I'm also in my 41st year of marriage. So I got married at the same time as I went into politics. <laughs> and so that I could really go full circle, I married a very beautiful woman whose beauty matches her brain. We have three kids, one of whom is a special child, and really, I think, has to a great extent influenced the feelings that I have brought into public life, the emotion, the sensitivity, the compassion, and real understanding that families in the Bahamas are vulnerable, sometimes affected by disability, other times by emotional considerations, by poverty, major unemployment impacts, and therefore in the governance of a country, those of us who lead must be able to, as often as possible, allow our heart to, to influence our decisions. Just traveling up here, sitting next to the Minister of Education, in speaking to him about the wonderful work he's doing in education, I indicated to him that the first challenge of the Bahamas, unlike Jamaica, Barbados, St. Lucia, Trinidad, is that we are a chain of islands. A chain of islands spread over 100,000 square miles of water. And therefore, the governance of our country is much more difficult than countries in our region because we are constrained to duplicate infrastructure we have to build schools in every island, airports in every island, roads in every island. We have to find jobs for our young people in every island. And with the increasing globalization in the world, wherever tourists travel, and I think I should tell you the lifeline of the Bahamas happens to be the tourism industry, where some 75% of the jobs are directly or indirectly generated by the tourism industry, and where I'm the son of a taxi driver, a taxi driver who was able to have his children educated through various universities in the United States, in Canada, and in the United Kingdom, where I was educated, in England. But where fortune favored those working people in the Bahamas to enable them not only to aspire to have their children have an education, like Melanie is the daughter of a straw vendor, Mrs. Griffin, but to actually have parents with the opportunity to extract from the economy of the Bahamas sufficient to have their children educated. When the Progressive Liberal Party came to power in 1967, 
the first major commitment was to open up educational opportunities for Bahamians. To the point where the dominant feature of the budget of the Bahamas is education. An undying, unstinting commitment to giving our children the best opportunity to have a life of dignity. To be able to know that the future of our country has to be strengthened by giving these young people who you see here opportunities to be the best they can be. Earlier this year when I spoke to the installation of a new Vice Chancellor of the West Indies, in my speech I indicated that regrettably our countries in the region focus on the top 50% of students. Whereas the bottom 50% are the ones that give us great cause for concern. The social problems of countries where young people are unemployed and to a great extent that is a major challenge in, in our region and in the Bahamas. Unemployment for young people. That you can therefore find the connection between criminality and unemployment where they stray into areas of criminality. And so as we look to our country, we know we, on an increasing basis, must develop a commitment that can best be described that we will leave no child behind. And every child counts. And we have now taken that to the nth degree in this way. We have decided, philosophically, that every Bahamian child, whether disabled or otherwise, have a fundamental right to share in the equity of the Bahamas. Yes. Which means, therefore, that the government has to recognize that there are parents of children without the means to have their children even adequately fed sometimes. There are children who are handicapped by various disabilities. You see a child with severely bowed legs. You see a child with curvature in the back, scoliosis. You see these things in the system so I'm starting with children and talking about children because the future of our country depends on the extent to which we educate our children, we communicate to the parents of the children, whether single mothers or homes of two, that they have an obligation to give that child the best opportunity. And therefore, the opportunities for government increases. Now you live, we live in the Bahamas, and I want to be able to tell you what's happening there, island by island, and very quickly. As we speak to our future, as we look at the challenges, and there are two major challenges, the economy and unemployment and crime. And the importation of tendencies and traits similar to what we see in the United States of America with gangs. and killings where our young people are preying on each other 
and thus wanton disregard for human life is now having an extraordinary impact in terms of crime and the fear of crime in our country. And the government clearly must continue to work at strategies to deal with this. But the good news is we live in a beautiful country. The island of Bimini, 50 miles off the coast of Miami. When we came to power, we had the good fortune of meeting developers who wanted to invest in Bimini. And there's a development company called Genting, one of the world's largest resort companies, if not the world's largest resort company. Over the last three years, they have spent some $600 million in Bimini, the little quaint Bimini. They have instituted in Bimini a major cruise ship that they bought and developed to ply between Fort Lauderdale and Bimini. It is projected that when it is fully in play, it will bring 400,000 people a year to Bimini. They have therefore developed facilities to accommodate that cruise ship. They have lengthened the runway and therefore introducing that. They are in the process of completing a 300 room hotel branded by Hilton. 200 rooms are now open. They have built a casino on that island and they have some seven, 800 Bahamians employed with hundreds more as the hotel expands to come. Bimini is moving along and we are working to integrate the people of Bimini into this new economy as entrepreneurs and obviously as employees with meaningful employment. In Abaco, we have two major developments one called Winding Bay and one called Baker's Bay. Baker's Bay is the dominant of the two, hiring some seven, eight hundred Bahamians, increasing <coughs> their second homes. They've, this is an island off Marsh Harbor where you go by boat to it, and some of the world's leading people go there to play golf and buy homes, actresses and owners of American football teams and major golfers. Winding Bay was owned by Marriott and the Rich Carlton, and they have now sold to a new developer who's moving it wonderfully along. We are in the process of agreeing and settling a new development led by the Aman Group, which is the six-star resort group, dominant here in New York, and we should meet, I was due to meet with them, but the flight was delayed before this meeting. But they are developing a key at Abaco called Matlow's Key. So Abaco is the major second home destination in the Bahamas, and therefore it is banging along with people of a high net worth basis and the future looks very good. Um, we should be developing a new harbor, the Chinese construction company that was agreed by our predecessors, and we're settling that now in North Abaco um, to join the harbor in South Abaco, but Abaco is poised, I think, for significant development. Grand Bahama. Grand Bahama, again, is a very special kind of island where the Hawksville Creek Agreement was signed and you have a private company with the, um, the people who ran it initially are now dead, Sir Jack Haywood and his family and um, Edward St. George and his family. And we are in the process of trying to determine the future of Grand Bahama. And, um, because what has happened is 
Business license um, taxes on real property taxes have now become um, available to government as a tool. And the question is, what should the government do? Should we implement these taxes, or do we extend them in consideration of some special thing that will take place? We're making that decision now. But when we came to power three years ago, Grand Bahama was challenged. Grand Bahama is a mix of industrial companies and tourism. And in Freeport itself, there are petrochemical company, pharmaceutical company, um, a shipbuilding company, a heavy industry, and of course, their hotels. We are, are slowly improving the economy of Grand Bahama. Um, we have in the making a new cruise ship destination there. We have in the making a major expansion of a huge container port that exists that should start an expansion in October, November of this year, hiring another 300 people. So we are moving, we think, properly and effectively in Grand Bahama, which is really called the second city, um, with a population base only second to New Providence. And so Grand Bahama is OK. In New Providence, we had Bahama, we had this $3.5 billion development, 97% finished, and the developer filed for Chapter 11. The government of Bahamas resisted that um, Delaware court, saying that all of the activities of this company was based in New Providence, therefore it should be solved and addressed by the Bahamian courts. And we tried to, we went to court to protect the sovereignty of the Bahamas. We have succeeded, and both the Bahamian court and the Delaware court have now settled the matter in there. Um, two days ago, I was in New York. I flew to New York to meet with the construction company, one of the world's leading construction, in fact, the largest construction company in the world, China Construction. And they were the contractors. And I got from them a full agreement to resume construction subject to the liquidators, the provisional liquidators who were there. Last night, I did a, you know, um, morning in China is night in the Bahamas. So around nine last night, I started a conference call with the president of China Export Import Bank. We spoke for 45 minutes or thereabout on this conference call where I got the agreement of the bank to work assiduously with the construction company and the government of the Bahamas and the developer um, to resume construction. So I've now met with the construction company. I have met through a conference call with the bank. I have met with the bank's representatives at my office yesterday lunchtime. So I only now have to meet with the developer as prime minister, and I'm meeting with the developer on Monday. The intention is to be able to impress upon all of the parties that the government of the Bahamas wants this hotel or resort completed, because there are thousands of young people who will be employed. There are 15, 1,800 now we're paying for as, as we are waiting for this to recommence construction. We believe it's going to have an enduring, an invigorating impact on the economy of the Bahamas. And therefore, we are committed to bringing this about. The same Chinese company contractor has purchased the Hilton or British Colonial Hotel. And they're putting a major expansion to that starting now, where they're going to be bringing in, I can't talk it yet, but bringing in two major hotel brands to, to be branded along with the Hilton Hotel. So they're going to have two other brands to join the Hilton Hotel. And the deal we struck is different to the deal that was struck with the Chinese who built Ba, ba Ma. The same people, when we met with the president of China, we impressed upon the president that the Bahamas, like every other Caribbean country, suffers from unemployment. And we can't have 70% Chinese labor and 30% Bahamian. It has to be reversed. And so the president agreed with me, and the government is insisting on this particular deal that is 70% Bahamian labor and 30% Chinese labor. So it is reversing itself. Now, New Providence is the center. New Providence is the capital. New Providence is where the people live, and there. We are pushing this. We have Atlantis. 
we, we, we have we're now having this hotel, we're trying to do a deal to have the South Ocean open back up because we that now being purchased. We have two major residential resorts, Lightfoot Key that you know, and there's a new one called Albany, where some of the world's leading golfers live, where they are doing very, very well. And so things are happening in New Providence. Albany has now brought about the fact that we are now the, the strongest private jet distant, um, destination um, in the region. So things are banging along there. And uh, we move to Eleuthera. Eleuthera, um, again, is a, in a position where we've just announced um, that the man who's reportedly the richest Colombian in the world, Dr. Sarmiento, Luis Sarmiento, has agreed to put a Four Seasons five-star hotel resort development, mixed resort development, in South Eleuthera. And that will be joined on a golf course, etc. That's the old Cotton Bay. That will be joined by Franklin Wilson's development, where he has uh, brought in one of the leading resort companies out of Florida and California to, to run his properties there. So we're feeling good about Eleuthera. People are impatient. We know it's going to happen. We're about to commence building a mini hospital down there in Eleuthera, putting the infrastructure in. I've just acquired 50 acres of land. You know, we have situations where people will not, don't pay the tax. We say, okay, rather than, since you got a couple million dollars worth of land, you're not paying that, give me this land here, and then you don't have to pay the tax. And so that, that's strategically placed land where we put a sports complex. So Eleuthera is going well. So we move to Exuma. And let me, let me just say also on Eleuthera, on the end of Eleuthera is Harbor Island, North Eleuthera. Harbor Island has always been voted the best small destination in the Caribbean. And that's where a lot of wealthy people live with Bahamians mixing well. Um, I can tell you the government of the Bahamas has committed itself to major airport development in North Eleuthera, which leads to Harbor Island, in Governor's Harbor, in San Salvador, and Exuma. So again, $150 million worth of airport development. And obviously, we have to do that over a phased period of time. So we move to Exuma. You know, the astronauts say the prettiest waters in the world are around Exuma. So wherever you come from in the Bahamas, you could claim your island got something special. But Exuma, um, the emerald, you know, it, it, the colored water, it was just extraordinary. Exuma is a land of the mainland and a lot of keys. Uh, Tyler Perry has bought a, a developed a hundred million dollar island in Exomas. Um, fate, a lot of movie stars and David Copperfield and Musha Key, a lot of na named people have bought um, keys in the Exoma Keys and has become very famous for it. But what else is happening in Exoma is that we have major developments taking place in Exoma. New construction is going to take place. Um, a Swiss lady came in who is reportedly from a very um, substantial Swiss family. She wants to build the best small hotel in the world. She bought two keys, um, Children's Bay Key um, and um, Williams Key, and she's make, putting these two keys together. She's building this wonderful facility where they'll have houses for staff and so forth, but she is intending to have the best small hotel in the world. And they, and they brought in a whole crew of designers to do that and so forth. There are other developments taking place in Exoma. Um, the government is an advanced stage of knowing that Sandals is in Exuma, and the owners of Sandals is talking to us now about building a beaches in Exuma. That's another resort, sister resort to Sandals. So Exuma is therefore in a strong position um, moving forward. In Cat Island, for, um, we have in Cat Island, um, the former government, us, we've been working with a group um, to where they, a PGA golf course, where they want to put a PGA golf course resort there. Um, the government has agreed to build a new airport in New Bight or to renovate the airport in New Bight, in effect introduce a $10, $12 million expansion of the airport there on the condition that this resort will be built. And so again, you can see as I'm talking that these are sources of, of employment for young Bahamians creating new economies in these islands as, I'm, as we're moving through. And so again, in Exuma, we're doing well. We go now to San Salvador. In San Salvador, there's an 8,000 um, feet runway where planes come in direct from Paris into this little island. That's the island, of course, 
where Columbus was supposed to have landed in 1492, and where um, he met the Lucayne Indians, and where there's a club med facility there, and there are plans to expand the club med facility going on now, and plans to build two small hotels by Italian groups. But what we've had to do, the demands on governance is so profound that the people who are flying from Paris as prime minister, when we're coming in, we need a control tower because if it's raining, we need to be guided in. Having flown for nine hours, you can't reach El Salvador and say, oh God, we can't land. So we need that. They say we need facilities at the airport. So the government has had now to go and recalibrate with a view to providing the facilities to consistent with plane flying direct from Paris to this club med facility there, direct from Montreal, direct from New York. Again, San Salvador is going well. And it's something that we're, we are looking at. And so the, the position being this, I come to Andros and I want to stop. Andros is the largest island in the Bahamas. Anyone from Andros here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, the, the point is, Andros has been an island just sleeping there. A population of about 10,000 people, 104 miles long, 43 miles wide, the most extraordinary ecosystem in the world. It can be easily the fly fishing capital of the world. I've flown up here at the invitation of the University of Miami that is helping us, and I'll tell you about Andros. And I met some rich people who go fly fishing in Andros. They go to Cargill Creek, they go to Fresh Creek, they go, you know, they go to these places and they fly fish, catch and release. And we have some of the extraordinary fish down there. Well, Pinling once made a speech. Uh, I have a dream speech. I think it was in 82, 81, 82. And he obviously had a sense that he may not see the Bahamas develop to the point that he could dream of. And in the speech he said, one day the, cap the financial capital of the Bahamas will be Nassau. The industrial capital will be Grand Bahama. And he says, as America urbanizes, Florida urbanizes, the soil of Andros will lead Andros into becoming the agricultural capital for the Bahamas. And that we will produce in Andros. The pine trees in Andros will be used for resin and the wood and to create jobs for the Hamians. And he said, the muck or the mud on the west coast of Andros has some medicinal value to it, and that will be used to have facial packs for women. The governor of the Bahamas taking pending speech <coughs> has in fact put a major investment in Andros, the Bahamas Agricultural and Marine Science Institute. Andros has 138,000 arable acres of land and then we know therefore can sustain wonderful farming. And we've decided to do something special. And that is to not only create a teaching institution, but to attach to that institution a commercial farm and marine sciences of a commercial nature. In other words, in addition to teaching, we're going to grow. And so we have now, we've planted papayas um, and bananas. These things were in recognition that the Bahamas spends over $1 billion every year importing foodstuffs, we say it makes sense to try and grow some of that back. So that's what we're doing now. And we are moving as quickly as we can on that area. So Andros all of a sudden is taking a different view. The Inter-American Development Bank in Washington then offered us an opportunity that they gave to Belize. They said that you have this wonderful island with ocean holes, with streams of fresh water, 
sitting on salt water with flamingos. Very few people having been to the west coast of Andros, just one resort out there, small resort. You have this wonderful opportunity to extract from Andros a new economy. The Seminole Indians left Florida and went to Red Bay, St. Andros. And so you, I'm I actually a descendant myself. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bow leg. My, my grandmother was a bow leg. And therefore, you know, old chief bow leg. Um, that's where it, they originated. And so the point, the point is that, that Andros has this history, this, the ecosystems, and so the Inter-American Development Bank gave us this sponsorship where Stanford University has been retained. Now, to come into Andros and identify in Andros all of the sustainable economic activities that could lead to jobs and new businesses. Like, for example, Queen Victoria used to bathe with the velvet sponge. The velvet sponge, they say, doesn't exist now. Plenty of sponges exist down there. Just off Andros, it's the third largest barrier reef in the world, a 6,000 foot trench there. An abundance of opportunities for us. And so we're looking at it. And finally, we are now trying to take advantage of the assets we have. Those students are studying the sea. Today we have young people, in fact, this is one of the defining members of the maritime leadership in our country, Mr. Peter Galandres, who just walked in. But even though we are an ocean nation, we have not taken maximum advantage of that. And so the ship owners and the maritime flag have come and said they are, they are going to get involved with the government of the Bahamas to inspire Bahamians to get involved in the sea. And I'm told now that there are young Bahamians, including women, who are working on ocean-plying vessels around the world. And that's what they, these young people here are going to do. That's the aspiration. That is the aspiration. <clears throat> that is the dream. And we are now putting in place for it to be real. Now, and so as we leave Andros, and we look at the rest of the Bahamas, to those of you from the southern Bahamas, Maguana, Crooked Island, Acklands, and Nagua, we have this extraordinary opportunity as the gateway to the United States of America to continue to develop our country. The challenge for the country is to find sources of employment and to understand what assets we have. When we came to power, I found out we were exporting something called the Sea Whip. I forget the scientific name for it. But I said, what the devil is that? Out of the sea, they say, where there's heavy currents, there's an organism that is used and so, BAMSI, this Bahamas Institute we formed in, in Andros, <clears throat> was intended to recognize that people have been coming to the Bahamas and engaging in research, and taking that research out, and we don't know what it's about. That we have assets in our country, like salt. Morton Salt has been there, and I think they had a 999-year lease a long time ago, before some of us were born. <coughs> and the country is now renegotiating with them to see how we could get more out of the salt industry. We are now determining how to best utilize something called a ragonite. A ragonite in about five or six places in the Bahamas. And it regenerates. I'm told it could be a very significant industry. We've had studies done by University of Havana, University of Miami, 
all to ascertain that it doesn't disappear after a while. It keeps on coming back. And so we're looking at that and we want to move that because we're told hundreds of Bahamians can be employed. We know tourism industry is there. We know offshore, as an offshore financial center, we know that. We are looking to see how we can expand maritime by having a yachts registry, a more dynamic shipping registry, seeing how we can expand that, an arbitration center. So we're working hard. We're going into South America to see if we can have new products in terms of financial services. We're doing that. And we're driven by this reality that thousands of Bahamians are still unemployed and that we have to find a way to get them employed. We look to those of you who are abroad to continue with the goodwill for the country. We know more and more of our young people are staying abroad and we, we know we want to be able to attract them back home. And so we're working at putting in place the wherewithal that will enable them to see a future in the Bahamas. And we have to continue to believe that we can extract more from those areas in our economy that are working, like tourism, like financial services, and that the importance of establishing linkages with the tourism industry that brings 6 million people a year, 4 million by cruise ship, 2 million um, uh, by air, is to establish some linkage like growing the food, not all, just part of it, 100 million, 200 million of a billion dollars imported, beginning the process of doing so, and we are having success. And we've decided, for example, if you're spending $14 million a year on mutton, we decide that we're now going to create a sustainable mutton population of, of, of sheep and goat. And we're bringing in 600 from Texas. They're just being medically cleared now. And into Andros. And we're then going to artificially inseminate them with a view to being able to produce the right stream. So all of this again is that we are importing these things and there's now a market for organic goods, where the meats, where the fruits, where the vegetables. We've just brought in 6,000 mango and avocado and the rest of it, tree plants. Because my government has made a commitment to go for it. And on that subject, finally, tourists spend 250 to 300 million dollars a year on souvenirs and handicraft. And we have to be careful because people, anything that could sell, They'll bring it in. So I'll walk into a store and say, well, where do you get these shells from? I say, Vietnam. <laughs> Pretty shells, but they look just like the wilt shell. And if you polish the wilt shell, it's the same shell. And so the question is, the technology and the skill, and we're doing that through training programs, that will enable Bahamians to take advantage of the souvenir industry and cut into it 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, making progress on the basis that we know we have artistic geniuses in our country. We know that. We see it in Junkanoo, and you know, I was introduced, I am the best Junkanoo dancer <laughs> in the <world. laughs> No, no, see, I keep on telling them, man, you're some young people now, I wouldn't go up against, but I mean, the old ones like Vola Francis, an iconic figure. Vola is much younger than me, but he dances.
Fred Mitchell could show you how he dances. <laughs> but that brings me to the final point, and that is how we live, who we are, our culture. That Fred Mitchell took us to Sydney Poitier's house in January of this year on the way back from China. And we sat with this iconic man, the most known Bahamian in the world, most known man of color in the world. And he told us a story intending to inspire us as politicians. He said that, first of all, he was born by accident in the United States, his mother and daddy used to come over to sell tomatoes in Miami. And her water bag burst in Miami. And some people befriended her and took him and he was born. But he went fast forward and he said, as a young man, he had difficulties in reading and writing. And he was a dishwasher in New York. This is how I'm going to conclude with a sense of inspiration. And he says, one day a white waiter, Jewish waiter, saw him, the restaurant closed, he'd washed dishes, trying to read. And said, Sydney, what you doing? He said, I'm trying to read. He said, but well, Sydney, I'm going to stay behind after we've cleaned the tables and you've washed, and I'm going to teach you how to read. So he said, but for that intervention, this is Sidney Poitier, who went on to win two Academy Awards, who went on to become a producer and a director of movies, and an author. And he was speaking about someone reaching down and helping him to become better. And he said, that is the role of a government. Prime Minister, that is the role that you and your colleagues must play here in the Bahamas and in the Caribbean. Because there are young people who are potentially Sydney Poitiers, who are potentially Rihanna's, who are Usain Bolt. Find them. Give them the opportunity to be the best they can. P.J. Patterson, at my invitation, wrote a paper for prime ministers of the Caribbean region in which he showed that cultural industries and sports can be an extraordinary contributor to the economies of our countries. He showed that there are three Jamaican artists that earn more than the banana industry of Jamaica. A greater impact on the GDP of Jamaica than the industry. And that is, get your Rihanna's, get your Sydney Poitiers, get your Usain Bolt's, and give them that pathway to being the best they can. That's what's exciting about governance. And I said, on the way up here to the Minister of Education, as we introduce the University of the Bahamas this year, ensure that the scholarship system will enable us to go into Anagua and Maguana and Aklis and Crooked Island as well as Andros and the rest of it, and find these young kids with talent, both academically and athletically. And we don't have to try and get them into schools in the United States. In the first instance, Get them into your University of the Bahamas and let them know from the day they step foot they could get a scholarship yes. if they are. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. your so I want to be able to, to say that looking at our country, we are growing. We are excited about it. We have a wonderful democracy where we have demonstrated we can change governments. 
without batting an eye, without interfering with the continuity of governance and the stability of the country. And we're continuing to work at giving people of the world safe haven and refuge in our country insofar as they will make an impact on our economy in terms of a second home industry. So I'd like to thank you and hope in the process that I have given you an indication of where we are. I have um, a whole assortment of ministers here, and I, ju I just thought of uh, Melanie Griffin. Um, you know, I have a son called Adam. And Adam is a, a young man trapped in the body of a young man, but with real challenges. Many nights, I stay up with him. And the fact that I'm prime minister makes no difference. That happens to be my responsibility because we don't have anyone to stay at night with him. And I've always insulated my family against the unpredictability of behavior. But through the years of spending with Adam and wrestling with God as to why these things happen, I told the Pope when I met with him when was it a year ago? 2013. One of the first prime ministers to meet with him. I told him that I wrestled with God on an issue as to why these things happen. And then I said, you know, Christy, God made you prime minister. And maybe if you take your faith and apply the logic to it. He made you prime minister for a particular reason. That there are many, many, many mothers and fathers who are bewildered by the circumstances of their child or children in terms of disability. Melanie will sign ratify on Monday for the Bahamas convention here in New York where we've made a commitment to this but I think of the families who cannot who do not have the means that I have to seek the advice but who are subjected to extraordinary challenges. And I say to the young ones with me, that when I stood on the political platform and said, I'm gonna allow this to help me govern. It meant that when I saw a woman on a park with a cookout in Abaco, with a child who has a back curving scoliosis in the beginning of it. A young boy in the school in Nassau with severe curves in his legs and mummy hoping that the Shriners in the United States would be able to book him in. Or a child in Eight Mile Rock, Grand Bahama, who mother how cockles because she has some form of skin cancer. And I articulate philosophically a view that to the extent that our country has resources available to the government, we cannot allow these, particularly these single mothers without any kind of help, to be held hostage to these extraordinary circumstances facing their children. 
And therefore, the Minister of Education, the Ministry of Education, must somehow find it necessary to import into its work the protection of every child. We even sat and spoke and said there are children whose learning is impaired because they go to school hungry. But if they go to school hungry, then let's research it, put a breakfast program in place until they can do better. And so I leave you with those sorts of concerns that personally I've had in my own family the challenge. And it's a challenge that makes you sensitive to the need for there being universal health care. And so we are committed to national health insurance. And we want to do it with the least disruption to our economy. And so as I began by telling you the difficulties of governance because we are spread over 100,000 square miles of ocean, the need to build schools in every island, roads in every island, electricity in every island, cable in every island, people in an hour could sit and watch the Pope conduct mass in Rome. We fiberized our islands, but it's expensive. And so I'm so happy to see so many of you come out. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>